Hey everyone, Dr. Romani here. Welcome back to this YouTube channel on narcissism, narcissistic relationships, how to survive and heal from these relationships, and every so often, a little bit of a look at popular culture. So yeah, I know a lot of people, Sex in the City, it's back out there again. You know my thoughts on it. These women of a certain age like me are definitely living in a sassier world than I am. But they're not the only narcissists on the show. Gotta say that over the years, the men of Sex in the City definitely set that narcissism bar real high. So let's take a look at that. As this new series, and just like that, comes out, it takes us back to this entire self-indulgent crew that is this retrograde group of gals, and we've already talked about their egocentricity and the narcissistic patterns that they bring. We're clear on that. But like I said, it's the men who actually often kind of sucked a lot of the narcissistic energy out of the room, so much so that we sometimes miss it in the women. There were a lot, and some were too, some of these characters were too minor to get into because this video would take forever. So I'm gonna stick to the narcissistic dudes that jump out. Obviously, this show does not have the same narcissistic juice as Succession, but some of the Sex and the City characters are so awful that I think I might actually prefer having a coffee with Roman than these folks. So let's take it from the top. I know, it's, I, I almost wish I could hear your voices because you're thinking Mr. Big, right? Big, he is low hanging fruit. Grandiose narcissist through and through. Entitled, manipulative, gaslighting, betrayer, cheater, love bombing, controlling, arrogant, selfish. He hits all of the top notes. He and Carrie were in a trauma bonded mess of a relationship for the entire series from the beginning until he drops dead. Sorry about the spoiler. His hypersensitivity about a wedding meant that the fool couldn't figure out a way to get a message to her, instead claiming he can't get married because it was all so overwhelming. She would behave like a geriatric ingenue, ooing and eyeing about the apartments and closets and lifestyle he provided. He cheated on his wife with Carrie and constantly hoovered, especially when she was in a relationship. He was the template for urban financier, financier, narcissistic men that would persist in perpetuity. He probably takes the crown. But let's go to number two. I think this guy is a dead heat. Alexander Petrovsky. Carrie could pick him, couldn't she? And given her narcissism, she was drawn to the shiny, love bomby person, and that was him. The character was meant to be a Russian artist who lived some sort of egocentric, arty life. His process of subjugation was very clear with her. Any relationship with him was meant to be that the person he was in a relationship with was to be of service to him. And that culminated of her having to move where it, ended, where it worked for him, which ended up being Paris. I give the dude credit for being clear that he was selfish and he was codifying it. Mostly the relationship was about him being vaunted and her being along for the ride. Their relationship culminates in one of the most narcissistic scenes of the series. He has a big art show in Paris, and he was such a narcissistic fool that he was overwhelmed with panic about his light show. And she, realizing that Paris was really only going to be about him, and that he didn't really care, he just kept proclaiming about how great Paris was. Well, in the face of that, she started smoking again and eating a lot of pastries. She even met with his ex, who was giving her very clear signals that this guy was very narcissistic. On the night of the art show, of course, his fragile ass panics, she ends up blowing off the dinner that very nice people set up for her to sort of fet her book. She gets to the museum, holds his sad, vulnerable, narcissistic hand, and then when he is the toast of the exhibition, he walks away from her. He tries to win her over with diamonds and a suite at a fancy schmancy hotel, but this one, this girl needs to take a break between men, first of all. The narcissistic big then comes to rescue her from the narcissistic Russian. And I will forever be baffled on how she fit that enormous feather dress in a suitcase. Let's talk about Berger. To me, Berger was the prototype of the vulnerable narcissist. He's like a teaching case. He was the gifted but couldn't get commercial success writer. He was contemptuous of all things Carrie, Carrie again. 
he still had a bizarre fixation with his ex and insisted on using a frog sound sleep machine that the ex gave him. But the trauma bonded Carrie just couldn't let it go. She is a great example of how narcissistic people can be trauma bonded. And she keeps trying to turn him into something that he wasn't. And he just got more and more resentful of her success, of her book advance, of the fancy shirt she got him. And then in very vulnerable narcissistic fashion to be punitive, he pushes her to ride on his motorcycle to some red carpet event where the photographers didn't want him in the picture. And I think her hair kind of got messed up because he put the big helmet on it. But he couldn't be in the picture because he's not famous, which kind of only makes his vulnerable, victimized blood boil more. It all culminates in the infamous breakup scene where he leaves her a post-it on evasive carnations saying, I'm sorry, I can't, don't hate me which Carrie the victim then uses as a rationale to get out of being arrested for public marijuana smoking and extra points for Carrie once again flaunting her privilege. Then we've got Richard Wright, the hotel guy. Remember him? Another grandiose narcissist. He owned a hotel and Samantha was to be hired for PR. He's very handsome and charming and charismatic. He said a bunch of misogynistic things to her and she walked away and held her tears back until she got into the elevator. So she was crying about this, but she didn't cry at her friend's mother's funeral. Richard Wright was a cheater, manipulator, love bomber. He had few emotions. He used sex to regulate. He treated his partner as a sex object and nothing more, which kind of worked with Samantha. He used transactional tricks like very expensive jewelry or very sort of bizarre underwear to win her back and felt entitled to do just what he wanted whenever he wanted. Like many of the men on this show, he made his move when he saw Samantha was in a relationship with the inappropriately young but devastating more sweet and attractive Smith, who actually was a man who probably wasn't narcissistic on this show, and Samantha being the narcissistic person she is, went with it. His excuse when she caught him mid-oral with a woman was that it was nothing and he loves her. Gross, narcissistic, awful, and I actually always thought the best one for her. And then there's Anthony Marantino. I love this character, but he is so, so mean. So he says mean things. He's gossipy, judgmental, petty, unempathic, snobby, entitled, superficial, vain, and vapid. He's a grandiose narcissist in more of that sort of superficial vein. He was Charlotte's best friend, a gay man, because of course everything on the show sort of played as a stereotype and a trope. And this may, I mean, I think Anthony Marantino may have been their, their attempt at diversity. But the Anthonys of the world often get a free pass because they're sort of written off as spicy or someone who speaks their mind. Nope, very narcissistic and difficult. And were it not for his style guidance or her smashing lifestyle, he wouldn't have been friends with Charlotte either. His relationship with his, at the end of the show, Stanford, felt asymmetric. And I felt that Stanford wasn't getting the healthier end of that relationship. Then there's Trey. Remember him? Trey McDougall. I think that was his last name. Trey is the waspy doctor that Charlotte marries. He is of Scottish origin and he wears kilts and all, but he's an American. He's ridiculous, he lacks empathy, he has little emotional depth, very entitled, arrogant, emotionally distant, and largely empty. When we meet his malignant narcissistic mother, we understand why, but he has to take some responsibility too. Charlotte certainly had her misgivings about marrying this a-hole, but she pressed ahead because she cared more about life checklists. On paper, their relationship kind of made sense, but it was the kind of intimacy impoverished relationship one would expect with a narcissistic person. He wasn't terrible in the divorce though. Some of you may say, oh, Trey wasn't bad in the divorce, so maybe he wasn't narcissistic, but his complete incapacity to ever see her from the beginning to the end of this relationship was very telling. Then I'm gonna say folks, I actually don't think Aiden was a narcissist. I think he could be a little manipulative at times and would often sort of try to 
teach Carrie a lesson. So I do think that sort of Aiden was narcissism adjacent for sure. In the movie made from the TV show, he was willing to have his little makeout session in the whatever that was, the, the, uh, the Middle Eastern market, despite him being married and her being married. But she was never in the relationship, fully in the relationship with him. Big was the ghost that haunted the relationship to the very end. Aiden tried to work the sexy carpenter vibe too hard, and it came out as a little whiny and victimy and manipulative at times, but it was nothing like these other dudes. And then another primary male, male character, partner character in the story is Steve. I don't think Steve, Miranda's husband, was a narcissistic person. I think she was not nice to him most of the time. She was often sneering, contemptuous, and dismissive of him. He was unfaithful. I know I did not forget. But again, one cheating episode, remember, doesn't make someone a narcissist. Obviously, there were the many other bit characters that came and went and were all really sad models of masculinity. That stunted scooter riding guy who lived with his parents, the old politician guy, and tons more I know I am not remembering. I mean, Sex in the City captures a bizarre moment of the 90s and the early aughts that is behind us and strangely feels so long ago. But it also reminds us that narcissism never sadly goes out of style and always makes for better TV. Them's my thoughts. I'm sure you have some too. Let me know them. Thanks again.